today for First Chapter Friday, we are reading Harriet the Spy. Let's begin! Harriet M. Welsh is a spy. She staked out a spy route, and she writes down everything about everyone she sees, including her classmates and her best friends, in her notebook. I bet the lady with the cross eye looks in the mirror and feels just terrible. Pinky Whitehead will never change. Does his mother hate him? If I had him, I'd hate him. Then, Harriet loses track of her notebook and it ends up in the wrong hands. Before Harriet can stop them, her friends have to read the always truthful, sometimes awful things she's written about each of them. Will Harriet find a way to put her life and her friendships back together? All right, here we go, Harriet the Spy, chapter one. Harriet was trying to explain to Sport how to play town. See, first you make up the name of the town, then you write down the names of all the people who live in it. You can't have too many or it gets too hard. I usually have 25. Um, Sport was tossing a football in the air. They were in the courtyard of Harriet's house on East 87th Street in Manhattan. Then when you know who lives there, you make up what they do. For instance, Mr. Charles Hanley runs the filling station on the corner. Harriet spoke thoughtfully as she squatted next to the big tree, bending so low over her notebook that her long straight hair touched the edges. Don't you want to play football? Sport asked. Now listen, Sport, you never did this and it's fun. Now, over here next to this curve in the mountain, we'll put the filling station. So if anything happens there, you remember where it is. Sport tucked the football under his arm and walked over to her. That's nothing but an old tree root. What do you mean, a mountain? That's a mountain. From now on, that's a mountain, got it? Harriet looked up into his face. Sport moved back a pace. Looks like an old tree root, he muttered. Harriet pushed her hair back and looked at him seriously. Sport, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know what. You know I'm going to be a ball player. Well, I'm going to be a writer. And when I say that's a mountain, that's a mountain. Satisfied, she turned back to her town. Sport put the football gently on the ground and knelt beside her, looking over her shoulder at the notebook in which she scribbled furiously. Now, as soon as you've got all the men's names down and their wives' names and their children's names, then you figure out what their professions are. You've got to have a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief. Sport interrupted. No, someone who works in television. What makes you think they have to have television? I say they do. And anyway, my father has to be in it, doesn't he? Well, then put mine in there too. Put a writer in it. Okay, we can make Mr. Jonathan Fishbane a writer. And let him have a son like me who cooks for him. Sport, Sport rocked back and forth on his heels chanting a, in sing song. And let him be 11 year old like me. And let him have a mother who went away and has all the money and let him grow up to be a ball player. No, Harriet said in disgust. Then you're not making it up. Don't you understand? Sport paused. No, he said. Just listen, Sport. See, now that we have all this written down, I'll show you where the fun is. Harriet got very businesslike. She stood up, then got on her knees in the soft September mud so she could lean over the little valley made between the two big roots of the tree. She referred to her notebook every now and then, but for the most part she stared intently at the mossy lowlands which made her own town. Now, one night, late at night, Mr. Charles Hanley is in his filling station. He is just about to turn out the lights and go home because it's 9 o'clock and time for him to get ready for bed. But he's grown up, sport looked intently at the spot occupied by the gas station. In this town, everybody goes to bed at 9.30, Harriet says definitely. Oh, Sport rocked a little on his heels. My father goes to bed at 9 in the morning. Sometimes I meet him getting up. And also, Dr. Jones is delivering a baby to Mrs. Harrison right now over here in the hospital. Here is the hospital, the Carterville General Hospital. She pointed to the other side of town. Sport looked at the left route. What is Mr. Fishbane, the writer, doing? Harriet pointed to the center of town. He is in the town bar, which is right here. Harriet looked down at the town as though it hypnotized. Here's what happens now. This night, 
as Mr. Hanley is just about to close up, a long, big, black, old car drives up, and in there are all these men with guns. They drive in real fast, and Mr. Hanley gets scared. They jump out of the car and run over and rob Mr. Hanley, who is petrified. They steal all the money in the gas station, and then they fill up with gas, free, and then they zoom off in the night. Mr. Hanley is all bound and gagged on the floor. Sport's mouth hung open. Then what? At the same minute, Mrs. Harrison's baby is born, and Dr. Jones says, You have a fine baby girl, Mrs. Harrison, a fine baby girl. Ho, ho, ho. Make it a boy. No, it's a girl. She already has a boy. What does the baby look like? She's ugly. Now, also at this very minute, on the other side of town, over here past the gas station, almost to the mountain, the robbers have stopped at a farmhouse, which belongs to old Farmer Dodge. They go in and find him eating oatmeal because he doesn't have any teeth. They throw the oatmeal on the floor and demand some other food. He doesn't have anything but oatmeal, so they beat him up. Then they settle down to spend the night. Now, at this very minute, the police chief of Carterville, who is called Chief Herbert, takes a stroll down the main street. He senses something is not right, and he wonders what it is. Harriet, get up out of that mud. A harsh voice rang out from the third floor of the brownstone behind them. Harriet looked up. There was a hint of anxiety in her face. Oh, oh golly. I'm not in the mud. The face of the nurse looking out the window was not the best looking face in the world, but for all its frowning, its sharp dark lines, there was kindness there. Harriet M. Welsh, you are to rise to your feet. Harriet rose without hesitation. But listen, we'll have to play town standing up, she said plaintively. That's the best way came back sharply, and the head disappeared. Sports stood up too. Why don't we play football then? No, look, if I just sit like this, I won't be in the mud. So, say, so saying, she squatted on her heels next to her town. Now, he senses that something's wrong. How can he? He hasn't seen anything, and it's all on the other side of town. He just feels it. He's a very good police chief. Well... Sport said dubiously. So, since he's the only policeman in town, he goes around and deputizes everybody, and he says to them, Something is fishy here in this town. I feel it in my bones. And everybody follows him, and they get on their horses. Horses? Shrieked. Sport shrieked. They get in the squad car, and they drive around town until... Harriet? The back door slammed, and old Golly marched squarely toward them across the yard. Her long black shoes made a slap-slap noise on the brick. "'Hey, where are you going?' asked Harriet, jumping up, because old Golly had on her outdoor things. Old Golly just had indoor things and outdoor things. She never wore anything as recognizable as a skirt, a jacket, or a sweater. She just had yards and yards of tweed, which enveloped her like a lot of discarded blankets, which ballooned out when she walked in which she referred to as her things. I'm going to take you somewhere. It's time you began to see the world. You're 11 years old, and it's time you saw something. She stood there above them, so tall that when they looked up, they saw the blue sky behind her head. Harriet felt a twinge of guilt because she had seen a lot more than old golly thought she had, but all she said was, oh boy, and jumped up and down. Get your coat and hurry. We're leaving right now. Oh, golly, always did everything right now. Come on, Sport, it won't hurt you to look around too. I have to be back at seven to cook dinner. Sport jumped up as he said this. We'll be back long before that. Harry and I eat at six. Why do you eat so late? He has cocktails first. I have olives and peanuts. That's nice. Now go get your coats. Sport and Harriet ran through the back door, slamming it behind them. What's all that noise? spluttered the cook who whirled around just in time to see them fly through the kitchen door and up the back stairs. Harriet's room was at the top of the house, so they had three flights to run up, and they were breathless by the time they got there. Where are we going? Sport shouted after Harriet's flying feet. I don't know, Harriet panted as they entered her room, but old golly always has good places. Sport grabbed his coat and was out the door, and halfway down the steps when Harriet said, wait, wait, I can't find my notebook. Oh, what do you need that for? Sport yelled from the steps. I never go anywhere without it, came the muffled answer. Oh, come on, Harriet. There was a great cracking noises. There were great 
There were great cracking noises coming from the bedroom. Harriet, you fall down? A muffled but very relieved voice came out. Found it! It must have slipped behind the bed, and Harriet emerged, clutching a green composition notebook. You must have a hundred of them now, Sport said as they went down the steps. No, I have 14. This is number 15. How could I have a hundred? I've only been working since I was eight. I wouldn't even have this many, except at first I wrote so big my regular route took almost the whole book. You see the same people every day? Yes. This year I have the De Santi family, little Joe Curry, and the Robinsons, Harrison Withers, and a new one, Mrs. Plummer. Mrs. Plummer is the hardest because I have to get in the dumbwaiter. Can I go with you sometime? No, silly. Spies don't go with friends. Anyway, we'd get caught if there were two of us. Why don't you get your own route? Sometimes I watch out my window, a window across the way. What happens there? Nothing. A man comes home and pulls the shade down. Well, that's not very exciting. It sure isn't. They met Old Golly waiting for them, tapping her foot outside the front door. They walked to 86th Street, took the Crosstown bus, and soon were whizzing along in the subway, sitting in a line. Old Golly, then Harriet, then Sport. Old Golly stared straight ahead. Harriet was scribbling furiously in her notebook. What are you writing? Sport asked. I'm taking notes on all these people who are sitting over there. Why? Oh, Sport, Harriet was exasperated. Because I've seen them and I want to remember them. She turned back to her notebook and continued her notes. Man with rolled white socks, fat legs, woman with one cross-eyed and a long nose, horrible looking little boy, and a fat blonde mother who keeps wiping his nose off. Funny lady looks like a teacher and is reading. I don't think I'd like to live where any of these people live or do things that they do. I bet that little boy is sad and cries a lot. I bet that lady with a cross eye looks in the mirror and just feels terrible. Oh golly, leaned over and spoke to them. We're going too far Rockaway. It's about three stops from here. I want you to see how this person lives, Harriet. This is my family. Harriet almost gasped. She looked up at Old Golly in astonishment, but Old Golly just stared out the window again. Harriet continued to write, This is incredible, Old... This is incredible. Could Old Golly have a family? I never thought about it. How could Old Golly have a mother and a father? She's too old for one... She's too old for one thing, and she's never said one word about them, and I've known her since I was born. Also, she doesn't get any letters. Think about this. This might be important. They came to their stop, and Old Golly led them off the subway. Gee, said Sport as they came up on the sidewalk. We're near the ocean, and they could smell it. The salt and even a wild soft spray which blew gently across their faces then was gone. Yes, said Old Golly briskly. Harriet could see a change in her. She walked faster and held her head higher. They were walking down a street that led to the water. The houses set back from the sidewalk with a patch of green front were built of yellow brick interspersed with red. It wasn't very pretty, Harriet thought, but maybe they liked their houses this way better than those plain red brick ones in New York. Old Golly was walking faster and looking sterner. She looked as though she wished she hadn't come. Abruptly she turned into a, abruptly she turned in at a sidewalk leading to a house. She strode relent, she strode relentlessly up the steps, never looking back, never saying a word. Sport and Harriet followed, wide eyed, up the steps to the front door, through the front hall, and out the back door. She'd lost her mind, Harriet thought. She and Sport looked at each other with raised eyebrows. Then they saw that Old Golly was heading for a small private house which sat in its own garden behind the apartment house. Harriet and Sport stood still, not knowing what to do. The little house was like a house in the country, the kind Harriet saw when she went to Watermill in the summer. The unpainted front had the same soft gray of driftwood. The roof was a darker gray. Come on, chickens. Let's get a hot cup of tea. Oh, golly, suddenly gay, waved from the funny little rotting porch. Harriet and Sport ran toward the house, but stopped cold when the front door opened with a loud swish. There suddenly was the largest woman Harriet had ever seen. Why, look at here what's coming, she bellowed. Look at them little rascals. And her great fat face crinkled into a large cheerful lumps as her, mother, as her mouth split to show a toothless grin. She let forth a high burbling laugh. Sport and Harriet stood staring. 
their mouths open. The fat lady stood like a mountain, her hands on her hips in a flowered cotton print dress and an enormous hanging coat sweater. Probably the biggest sweater in the world, thought Harriet. Probably the biggest pair of shoes, too. And her shoes were a wonder. Long, long, black, bumpy things with high laced sides up to the middle of the shin, bulging with the effort of holding those ankles, holding those ankles, their laces splitting them into grins against the white of the socks below. Harriet fairly itched to take notes on her. Where'd you get these little things? Her cheer rang out all over the neighborhood. This is a little Welsh baby that her brother? Sport giggled. No, it's my husband, Harriet shouted. Old golly turned a grim face. Don't be snarky, Harriet, and don't think you're such a wit either. The fat lady laughed, making her face fall in lumps again. She looks like dough, Harriet thought, about to be made into a big, round Italian loaf. She wanted to tell Sport this, but old golly was leading them in, all of them squeezing past that mountain of a stomach because that fat lady stood rather stupidly in the doorway. Old golly marched to the tea kettle and put a fire under it. Then she turned in a business-like way and introduced them. Children, this is my mother, Mrs. Golly. Mother, you can close the door now. Mother, this is Harriet Welsh. Harriet M. Welsh, Harriet corrected. You know perfectly well you have no middle name. But if you insist, Harriet M. Welsh, and this is Sport. What's your last name, Sport? Rock. Simon Rock. It's pronounced Rock. Simon. Simon. He he he. Harriet felt... Harriet felt very ugly all of a sudden. You are not to make fun of anyone's name. O'Golly loomed over Harriet and it was one of those times when Harriet knew she meant it. I take it back, Harriet said quickly. That's better. O'Golly turned away cheerfully. Now, let's all sit down and have some tea. Wall, ain't she a cute little thing? Harriet could see that Mrs. Golly was still hung up on the introductions. She stood like a mountain her big ham hands dangling helplessly at her sides. Sit down, mother, old golly said gently, and Mrs. Golly sat. Harriet and Sport looked at each other. The same thought was occurring to both of them. This fat lady wasn't very bright. Mrs. Golly sat to the left of Harriet. She leaned over Harriet, in fact, and looked directly into her eyes. Harriet felt like something in a zoo. Now, Harriet, look around you, old golly said sternly as she poured the tea. I brought you here because you'd never seen the inside of a house like this. Have you ever seen a house that has one bed, one table, four chairs, and a bathtub in the kitchen? Harriet had to move her chair back to see around Mrs. Golly, who leaned toward her motionless, still looking. The room was a strange one. There was a sad little rug next to the stove. Harrison Withers has Harrison Withers only has a bed and a table, Harriet thought to herself, but since she didn't want O'Golly to know she had been peering through Harrison Withers' skylight, she said nothing. Said I didn't think you had, said old golly. Look around and drink your tea, children. You may have more milk and sugar if I haven't put enough if I haven't put enough. I don't drink tea, Sport said timidly. Old golly shot an eye at him. What do you mean you don't drink tea? I mean I never have. You mean you've never tasted it? Nope, said Sport and looked a little terrified. Harriet Harriet looked at Old Golly. Old Golly wore an arch expression which signified that she was about to quote, There are few hours in life more agreeable than the hour dedicated to the ceremony known as afternoon tea. Old Golly said this steadily and sedately, then leaned back in the chair with a satisfied look at Sport. Sport looks completely blank. Henry James, said Old Golly, 1843 to 1916, from Portrait of a Lady. What's that? Sport asked Harriet. A novel, silly, said Harriet. Oh, like my father writes, said Sport, and, and dismissed the whole thing. My daughter's a smart one, mumbled Miss Golly, looking straight at Harriet. Behold, Harriet, old Golly said, a woman who has never had any interest in anyone else, nor in any book, nor in any school, nor in any way of life, but has lived her whole life in this room, eating and sleeping and wanting to die. Harriet stared at Mrs. Golly in horror. Should, oh, golly be saying these things wouldn't mrs golly get mad but mrs golly just sat looking contentedly at harriet perhaps thought harriet she forgets to turn her head away from something unless she is told try it sport it's good harriet spoke to sport quickly in an effort to change the subject sport took a sip not bad 
he said weakly. Try everything, sport, at least once, old Golly said. This as though her mind weren't really on it. Harriet looked at her cautiously. Harriet looked at her curiously. Oh, golly, was acting very strangely indeed. She seemed, she seemed, was she angry? No, not angry. She seemed sad. Harriet realized with a start that this, that it was the first time she had ever seen Oh, golly, look sad. She hadn't even known Oh, golly, could be sad. Almost as though she were thinking the same thing, Oh, golly, suddenly shook her head and sat up straight. Well, she said brightly, I think we have had enough tea and enough sights for one day. I think we better get home now. The most extraordinary thing happened next. Mrs. Golly leaped to her feet, her fat feet, and threw her teacup down on the floor. You're always leaving. You're always leaving. She screamed. Now, mother, old Golly said calmly. Mrs. Golly hopped around the middle of the floor like a giant doll. She made Harriet think of those balloons blown up like people that bounce on the edge of a string. Sport giggled suddenly. Harriet felt like giggling. Harriet felt like giggling, but she wasn't sure she should. Mrs. Golly bobbed away. Just come here to leave me again. Always leaving. Thought you'd come for good this time. Now, mother, old Golly said again, but this time got to her feet, walked to her mother, and laid a firm hand on her bouncing shoulder. Mother, she said gently, you know I'll be here next week. Oh, that's right, said Mrs. Golly. She stopped jumping immediately and gave a big smile to Harriet and sport. Oh, boy, said Sport under his breath. Harriet sat fascinated. Then Old Golly got them all bundled into their clothes, and they were outside on the street again. Having waved to a cheerful Mrs. Golly, they walked along through the darkening day. Boy, oh, boy, was... Boy, oh, boy, was all Sport could say. Harriet couldn't wait to get back to her room to finish her notes. Old Golly looked steadily ahead. There was no expression on her face at all. That was chapter one of Harriet the Spy. Teachers, check out the links below.